Are they safe? We have a fabulous pediatrician who also happens to be a mom. Tell us a little bit about this on both sides. Uh, Dr. Pierce is with us. Hello, Dr. Pierce. <laughs> so, Dr. Pierce, let's just get started. One, can you turn? I think you need to turn your volume down just a little bit. We have a slight echo. Uh, okay. Hmm. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try. Uh, let's see here. Yes, I will. Okay, yep, got it. Okay, cool. Is that better? I think it's, yeah, I think it's a little bit better. Okay, so first of all, we need to start off with, because if you're gonna talk about vaccines, we have to start off with the age old question. Why is it that black people do not trust people in the medical community, nor the research that comes out? And I mean, we know the historical. Right, right. And the unfortunate part is that we do have a dark history about how black people have been used in medicine. Um, going back as far as slavery, we were just used experimentally, not given any type of pain control. And many surgeries, like um, the a lot of the statues of that Dr. Sims, one of the um, leaders in surgical um, obstetrics, um, were asked to be removed for that same purpose because his specimens were female slaves that were used with no anesthetics. Um, in which he developed a lot of the procedures that we use today. Even as far as the Tuskegee studies, I mean, these are people who were used not knowing what they had. They were told they had bad blood. And for 40 years, these people went and were just observed so that they could understand better how syphilis works in the body. And these people were, even despite the penicillin being developed at that time, they weren't given treatment and suffered quite a bit under that. So of course, when these stories get told today, there's a lot of fear in how much can we trust the government? How much can we trust these studies now if you know we know we have these history, this history of this? So. so this is where I always say, thank you to Black Doctor um, for being a resource for this. But I always say, I, me personally, especially since I pay for everything now myself, I'm not under anybody else's insurance, all my doctors look like me. There you go. <laughs> okay, but they are all black people. <laughs> That's right. You know, and, of course, I think doctors of all nationalities will give quality care. Yes. Um, but if you have specific concerns, I think finding a doctor who looks like you, so therefore an African-American uh, mother or father comes right. to me, they can ask me questions like, well, what did you do for your children? Because of course, if I'm not going to give vaccines to my kids or I'm going to choose which ones to give, I certainly won't give it to somebody else's child. So we can have that open discussion. I mean, I've had moms come to me and say, you know, I really love you and I'm going to come to you for my health care, but I'm going to go to Naperville for my vaccines, which I think is hilarious because I'm like, OK, well, <laughs> I think our vaccines are the same. But, but there is that fear that within our community that we will get substandard care, medicine, and these are these are really myths that we really have to work hard as, as black physicians to help our, our patients understand. Yes, I, also, I need to say, please like and share this, you guys do watch parties and all that, because this is great information that needs to get out there, especially with what's happening in the world today. So I understand that and I think that, mm -hmm. I, I, and I, I think people always, you know, there are the older people who actually, I think most of that generation might be gone now, but there was the generation who felt like the physician had to be white. And, you Very know, that so. reason, that they felt more comfortable. But yeah. now I think, especially our generation, we tend to, you know, try to, you know, do things with our people. And um, hopefully, you know, and first of all, I think that if you don't get along with the physician, black, white or indifferent, you should get a new physician. So if you don't trust that person impeccably and you don't trust what's coming out of their mouth, then you should probably get a new doctor because your health is nothing to play with. And Absolutely. I think that's something that people sometimes feel like, well, I have to go to this doctor. No, you don't have to. You know, yes, you might have only a select few that you can pick from in your health care plan or whatever. But. You don't have to stick to that one. Right. You know, I am really amazed at how many times I have um, close friends who will say, well, I went to my doctor, but I don't even understand what he said, or I don't know, they didn't really explain. 
it's really our job to explain what we're doing and why we're doing it. And if we can't get a good explanation or have our patients really understand what we're saying, then I should be at least able to direct you to where you can get more information. You know, the days of doctors just saying whatever and people just believing it are gone because everybody's because a Google people doctor. Are running to the internet. <laughs> everybody, everybody's a Google doctor. Right. And so it is really the onus is on us to help them navigate the um, Internet because they have to understand that everything on the Internet is not true. So, of course, you have a gazillion conspiracy theories. You have so many things that, you know, sound, you know, like, oh, that that has to be true and create all this fear. But when you actually research it and use legitimate sources, you find that that makes no sense. You know, right. one of the things that I was looking up when I was listening to a lot of the people who are against vaccines, um, they said, do you know formaldehyde is in these vaccines? Yes, formaldehyde at some point was in the vaccines, but formaldehyde actually is naturally occurring in our body. So of course, to someone who doesn't know, they would say, oh my God, they're trying to kill us. But when you understand the amount that is in there and the amount that naturally occurs, then you can say, okay, this is actually put in there to keep our vaccine safe. That's what our job is to help you navigate all of that information so that when people say things that sound scary, we can kind of walk you through and help you understand, no, not, not really a concern at all. <laughs> so. Right, exactly. So vaccines are they helpful and how do we know that they're helpful now i first my first thought is they're helpful because we know that polio that's why we don't have polio and that's why you know absolutely measles mumps and rubella disappeared for a long time but then right. it came back there you go <laughs> right so um you know one at, as physicians we are scientists so we have to go on factual knowledge right so if we just look back on the history of vaccines we don't even have to go that far. Many of these vaccines were developed like in the 1950s. So you look at things like, you know, polio. Polio, we used to have polio hospitals. People were fearful, just like we're fearful to go out now um, with all of the coronavirus. People were fearful that if they went out, they would get this um, polio, uh, either the paralytic or the acute illness of it. We don't see polio today. And there's a lot of belief, oh, that polio vaccine, you know, now the only polio we see is caused by the vaccine. Now, that to some extent may be true, but that polio won't kill you. So you may have some symptoms with the polio vaccine, but you absolutely will not get the polio that we used to see that would be detrimental to you. So that's where you have to understand that we, we have almost eradicated um, measles um, in this country until people decided, well, you know what? No, I, I don't need to vaccinate. And the biggest thing we have to understand is that vaccines only work when there is community buy-in. Vaccines don't work on an individual model. So if the entire community doesn't appreciate that one, we all need to be vaccinated and those who for some medical reason cannot, that's the only way that we can protect them is if the entire community, because people come in and out of this, country all the time. Exactly. So if you standardly have a vaccine um, model in place, when other people come into the country or, or you know, more and more people um, decide not to do vaccines, more and more disease will be present. So absolutely, our historical data alone proves that vaccines work. And we are living in the benefit of a successful va vaccine program. Absolutely, 100%. Correct. I, I totally agree. I know they didn't have a chip, chicken pox vax when we were coming along. Now they do, but they didn't. I got the chicken pox. And that's one of those things that if you get it bad enough, you probably will not get again. So I've been able to be in the presence of others with it and not got it. But I did have my measles, mumps, rubella. And then when you went to med school, we had to go and be revaccinated to make sure that we didn't catch right. anything in the hospital. So, you mm -hmm. know, I, I've had everything a couple of times. Just right, right, that, right. You know? so, and, and, and here's another thing to actually think about. So we understand uh, the COVID virus or the coronavirus is teaching us so much about infectious disease without vaccines. So in Illinois alone, in the last 60 days, we have lost 2,000 people. Yeah. Now imagine if you couple that with 
you know, the rates of what we used to lose four or 500 uh, people per year from the measles, mumps, and rubella, probably closer to 2,000 from con congenital um, rubella. When you, if we didn't have a vaccine program in place, not only would we be fighting COVID, we would be fighting diphtheria, we would be fighting polio, we would be fighting measles, mumps, we would be living in a sick society. So if we think this stay in and you know fighting COVID is oh so awful, add 14 more diseases on that and you would see what life would be like. Right. Uh, and yeah, it, more than 3,000 deaths, especially when you add in the underlying conditions, you know, it would be really bad. Somebody uh, said that they know a child that had the, ch the chicken pox vax that still got chicken pox. So mm -hmm. what yeah. vaccines do is protect you so that you don't get the worst situation. Absolutely. My father never had the chicken pox. So when me and my sister got them, that's when he mm -hmm. got them. An adult shouldn't get the chicken pox. It's just not a good idea. Right. He right. was sick. Like me and my sister, we were itching a lot. You know, we have scars to this day. But my dad was really, really sick. And there was, it went through my classroom in first grade. And there was another student in the class whose parent mm -hmm. got it as well. And she was very, very, very ill. So that's the whole thing with vaccines is that you don't want to get, you want to get the vaccine because you don't want to get worst case scenario. And exactly. You know, and you know, just like you see flu. that. Too, right. Yeah. Absolutely. Because we see that, you know, the, one of the arguments is, you know, why are we doing the chicken pox vaccine? It's a harmless disease. Well, if we didn't do it, and we allowed adult populations uh, to get the chicken pox, then we would actually, as you said, be seeing a lot more deaths from chicken pox. So these are the things, and even with the influenza, we have that uh, same thing. We would see almost 7 million more cases of influenza if we didn't have the um, flu vaccine available. Yeah, so it's definitely it's definitely necessary to um, have it out there. Only forty percent of the population gets the flu vaccine, vaccine, but you know that's right, and that's pretty scary. And again, you know that flu, you know, it had the, in uh, two, 2018, we had eighty thousand deaths from the flu. It was one of our worst flu uh, seasons, you know, in, in the recent history. Uh, or the recent years, I should say, and only 40% got vaccinated. Now imagine how many more lives we could have saved if more people had bought into getting the vaccine that year. You know, so these are things that I, I encourage um, my families as they come in. You know, if we look historically, we have a blueprint of what it looks like when we don't vaccinate. Right. We now know through COVID what a disease can do when a vaccine isn't available at all. So the best thing we can do for ourselves, you know, one of the um, funniest things that I hear a lot is that no, you know, vaccines, you know, it's it's uh, it's like genocide. They're they're trying to kill us. Um, the government does not have to spend a lot of money to kill you. They can just get a, a virus out of a lab, and with our vaccine rates, guess what? <laughs> they can do it real cheap and easy. So the best thing we can do for ourselves as a community is vaccinate. And, you know, I also get the question, how do we know what vaccines are safe? How do we know that there isn't something that should be taken off the market? One of the things parents um, can do and, 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 you know, for yourself or for your children is what is what vaccines are being used worldwide? Places like Sweden, Australia, these are countries that promote health. They're not worried so much about how much the vaccine makes, they're promoting health. So if we get, we look at the studies that are coming out of these other countries and they are supportive and they are giving it to their communities and they have low incidence of any uh, adverse reactions, that's a great way for us to know that these vaccines are, are safe here in our country. So uh, I've heard a lot about Autism concerns always linked to MMR. Mm -hmm. so I think what, I've had this discussion about a million times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there, there are a couple of um, reasons why autism and particularly MMR were related. Um, autism is a disease of communication um, and 
uh, ability to socialize. So um, the first thing that's noted is, is they're withdrawn and they have um, speech delays. So those developmental skills start coming in right around 15 months, 15, 18 months, which is around when the MMR is given. So it really does make sense that people will say, well, I got the measles, mumps, and rubella, and then my child stopped talking. Well, your child was just really starting to talk. And when we look at how autism develops, in, especially in uh, infants, they tend to be very quiet, low maintenance children. So the natural perception of them is they're a really good baby because look, I can put her down, she doesn't cry, she doesn't really you know, need much, very, very doesn't um, want you to hold too much. So it feels like the baby is a very easy baby until it's time for that baby now to start communicating. So they originally thought, well, it has to be the MMR and it's because they combined the measles, mumps and rubella into one vaccine. They said it disrupted the lining of the gut and caused inflammation and then it got to the brain and this is why. Well, study upon study shows that there's no sign of inflammation. Study upon study shows that the gut flora does not change. And even when um, the measles, mumps and rubella, um, the rates of its administration did not change, did not increase, the amount of autism did increase. So that makes you say, Mm, that's the first thing that tells me that these things are not related. The second thing is they um, said that there are um, high doses of mercury. I've, I've heard the thimerosal, it's the thimerosal. Thimerosal has been taken out of vaccine since 1999, I think. I think 2001 may have been the last time it was in the vaccines. Um, but here's a big news flash. Thimerosal was never in the measles, mumps, and rubella. So that could have never been a cause. And when we look at mercury in, um, uh, intoxication, those symptoms look nothing like an autistic child. So again, another reason to separate it. Um, and our, I think the last very supportive reason of why autism and vaccines are not related is that there is no immune response that we see in children with autism. There's no inflammation, there's no scar, there's no buildup of anything that could have come from these vaccines. So that relationship of MMR and uh, autism, there is just nothing to substantiate it. The unfortunate part is no one can really tell you what causes autism. Right. And that's where the anxiety for parents come from. Because we can't say, we know what it's not. We just don't know what it is. It is, yeah. So. And I mean, I can understand their their concern. Um, someone said that the Gates children were not vaccinated. They are fully vaccinated, says Melinda Gates, uh, Bill Gates' wife. Okay. Um, so uh, what? So you did speak on this a little bit already, but what mm -hmm. has coronavirus taught us about vaccines and infectious disease? You did speak a little bit about that. Right. Right yeah. You know, as as we sit here and watch all of this unfold, you know. Literally 60 days ago, coronavirus was not even present in our community, and except for very, very small numbers. And how quickly it can spread and affect, um, what was it over a million, I think, was the number for today? I think we hit our million mark of um, uh, people with it, over um, 60,000 deaths now in the United States in 60 days. You know, if we went back just to January, that was a disease that was, you know, in other countries only. Right. So it teaches us just how quickly and how much our interactions with people, how much um, sanitizer, hand washing, you know, our close connections and talking with people, how much these affect our health every single day. So if nothing else, if you weren't big on hand sanitizer, <laughs> COVID has definitely touched you. Right. Yes, yeah, everyone, everyone's washing. I talked to my um, my little friend. She's ten, and she said, "I wash my hands every five minutes." I said, Go. "Right, right." <laughs> it was the best lesson on washing hands that any any of us could have ever gotten. Right, right. Um, but it, it it really does show us, particularly in our community, that yes, we are always going to be at greater risk for any endemic that comes. So we have to prepare. Regardless of like how they're saying in Georgia, yeah, we're going to open up. Well, guess what? We're not going to open up right. because we are at higher risk <laughs> and we will definitely, you know, we will do without our hair being done and our nails being done because right. 
me and someone else going out may not have the same risk. So as a community, that's what we have to really learn is that we're at higher risk for things. One, we have to do better with our healthcare. We have to do better about believing in vaccines. And again, if you if you don't know or you don't trust, look through resources. Don't just default to the internet because again, we will go back to a lot of conspiracy theories but educate yourself on really what is out there and what's going on. And there is so much research. The other thing I encourage um, our community to do more of is get involved in research. We can't know what affects us if we don't sign up and well, no, I've, 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 actually, uh, Yeah, I've, um, I've actually moderated panels for, there's a company, there's, a, um, there's an organization that that's what they're trying to do is they need to diversify clinical trials because, you know, oh just because, that is, and they've already said, you know, certain hypertension medications don't work the same on us as they work on other people. The intake of salt does not do the same thing to other people as it does to black people. Mm -hmm. So there is definitely already information out there that tells us that they definitely need to include us when they do clinical trials because no, you know, not everyone is the same and you need right. to make sure you check and, you know, you know that. Right. And so, yeah, it goes back to our fear because so many of us are fearful to be involved in these um, trials. But one benefit of the Tuskegee um, experiment was that after that, so many policies were put in place to ensure that any subject knew exactly what they were signing up for, yes. whether they were illiterate or not, as as well as if there was a treatment, that treatment had to be offered. So you can't just blindly be in a study and be like, oh, sorry, you know, you're not getting it. If, if right. it's something that could be detrimental to your health, absolutely, that treatment has to be offered to you. Yeah, I, um, I actually personally have participated in several trials here in Chicago at the University of Chicago because um, it was it's about the condition I have. So I figured, why not try to help myself, mm -hmm. or my, you know, my future children who will probably have the same problem. That's and right. Um, they pay well, so. Right, there you go. <laughs> and for no other reason, there they you do go. pay very well. And when I say very well, I'm talking very well worth my time. That's right. Well, well, I do want to take one moment to do a testimonial and say that I um, did survive COVID. Thank you, Jesus. Um, and uh, that I will be signing up for every study, research, you know, known to mankind. And I will say that, yes, when that vaccine comes out, yeah, I'll be all good with getting it. Oh, wait, I already know that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It was a long month and very scary. Um, I actually got diagnosed on uh, the same day they had diagnosed that doctor, the ER doctor in New York, who died five died days in later. Jersey, yeah. So the anxiety and everything that went along with it. And it honestly is a very bizarre illness because you will feel literally if you're laying in your bed, you feel fine, you get up. By the time you like brush your teeth, you have to go back to bed. And the how exhausted you are is just not well, describable. I did an interview yesterday on my show and she said it sounded like, it felt like an anvil was sitting on her chest. Like that's yeah. how bad it was for her to breathe. Yeah. And I thought I had kind of gotten through it. And after, I think it was about day 19, I actually ended up having a pneumonia. So here I'm thinking I'm better. And then all of a sudden my saturations are dropping. I'm wheezing more. I'm having more chest pain only to find out. Yeah. That, um, that far into it, the day I'm supposed to go back to work, <laughs> I actually had more, more, more medicine and more time in bed. So. Goodness gracious. You know, I'm glad like, you're okay. I, yes. And, and they, yeah. and they are really trying to get this vaccine as soon as possible. I, I would love to know who's going to go get it besides you and, you know, other people like myself who are like, wait a minute, this right. is something that could probably take me out. So therefore I should probably go get right. the vaccine. Um, I've mm -hmm. never, um, the only vaccine I don't, I've never had a flu vac and that was because the flu vac was based in eggs mm -hmm. and I'm allergic. So, but, but here that is not a contraindication to get right. it. Yeah. So, so that was, that was my, that was why my doctor was like, well, and I've never knock on wood as bad as my, as my, as I knock on wood, I've never had flu. 
so we're gonna keep it that way. <laughs> yeah. So, but um, here I want you to know. Now, again, it does actually, I, you know, under supervision if you have severe, severe egg allergies. But it's severe. That's something people should know that an egg allergy does not mean. Right. So now, like I said, now they have changed things. And so mm -hmm. now, um, and I, my thing, I think I want to make sure I fall in the category because they are always is a shortage of flu vax too and all mm -hmm. of that. But my parents, they get their flu vax like clockwork. One, my mother's the one that blessed me with the asthma. And so she gets right. it plus her age. So Absolutely. they, they make sure they get it. So could you really quickly run through and somebody asked about why do they give the hepatitis vaccine 24 hours after birth? So if you could talk oh. about that too, but talk about the, the schedule for children. Sure. So um, hepatitis B is not a childhood illness. Why do we give it 24 hours after birth? Is because if the mother, unknown to their doctor, so somebody who doesn't have prenatal care, actually tests positive and passes that to the infant, that infant has a greater than like 90, 95% chance of getting a chronic illness. So it is really protective. Now doctors do have the option. If I know you have prenatal care, uh, you know, you've been followed throughout, you know, you can say my newborns don't get hepatitis B, but it, it, is, it is offered and kind of widely given unless a doctor says not to give it because that's too great of a risk to take. Right. right. So absolutely. So that's why it's offered in the, right at birth and then you'll get one at year two and then um after a year so. and so then what about the other vaccines what is the schedule so um it's quite a long schedule so yeah. in your uh, pretty much in your two and your four you're doing the same thing diphtheria tetanus and pertussis um that's one vaccine that's the right. dtap your polio and they can combine it to give you what's called penticill. So either they're gonna have, penticill is with Hib, the H influenza vaccine. So diphtheria being um, three, polio being another one, and the Hib, that makes it penticill, meaning five of them. Um, you get an oral one, which is the rotavirus, and then you get the pneumococcal um, vaccine or the Prevnar, that's the um, other one. Um, and the hepatitis B, the second dose is usually given at one month or at the two month vaccines together. The four month uh, vaccine schedule is uh, pretty much the same minus the hepatitis B. And then the six month, again, there's some variability because you can um, you know, exchange, but you would pretty much be getting um, the penticill again, the uh, polio and the pneumococcal and the rotavirus. So those are the two, four, and six. After you don't get any at nine, that's usually a developmental uh, evaluation. And then after the one year mark, and again, if your doctor doesn't do it exactly the same, that is because there is some variability in what can be given. But hepatitis B and hepatitis A are given at our 12 month. Um, then we give the MMR at 15 months and then the penticill again at your 18 months. And I did this off the top of my head, so if yeah. I you know, slaughtered it a little bit, but that's generally how it is. And then it's, there are three months between your 12 month, 15 and 18 month vaccine. So by 18 months, um, you got in most of your childhood, you got in all the childhood ones, and then you don't get another set until kindergarten. And that's the area, um, tetanus and pertussis, the polio, and then the MMRV is given again right before you go to kindergarten. So and so, are, how old are your children? My children, yeah. uh, 15, 15, 16, no, sorry, 15, 17, and 21 tomorrow. And all your, <laughs> your children have all have had all their vaccinations, correct? Absolutely. Yes. And Absolutely. We both have both had all of our vaccinations as well. So, That's I right. think that you, it's odd to me when I hear these parents that don't want to vaccinate because they've been vaccinated. That's what blows my mind. Yeah, you know, but again, you know, I think with time, with the advent of the internet, people are feeling like, no, I'm more knowledgeable and I'm educated now. And again, COVID again has taught us so much. Many of the people who said, you know, I'm going to hold church service because God will protect me. And then now we have all these pastors and people dying of COVID because of what science had already said. You need to stay apart, you know. So. It, it, there is a, you know, a fine line between, of course, we want to take into account that 
you know, what else could happen? But if we have factual data and science supporting things, it's, it's just hard. If, if you looked at the, um, the ratio of the getting sick from vaccine and actually getting the benefit, and you put that into the lottery, all of us would be playing the lottery, right? Right. <laughs> you're right. Exactly. You're absolutely, you're absolutely right. right. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. So, and so the, the, you have much less likelihood of winning the lottery than you do with winning the vaccine game. But yet we are totally comfortable playing lottery. <laughs> You are right. You are absolutely right. And mm -hmm. I think that um, I, and I guess my thing is for those that don't want to vaccinate, then I think your children need to basically live in a bubble because I worry and I'm scared for what could happen to them if they come in, count, you know, in contact with somebody and they get a hold of something they can't handle. Right, right. So the unfortunate thing is that, again, vaccines work only when communities buy into them. Um, if we have five people doing it and 25 people not doing it, unfortunately, vaccines will not work. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, like the HPV vaccine is probably the one that's on the chopping block right now. There's a lot of um, people not feeling comfortable with the HPV vaccine. Again, statistically, it does, um, we, we see a sharp decline in deaths um, from uh, HPV. It was um, the fifth leading cause of uh, death in young women. So there is validity of why it works. Now, again, it gets a lot of discussion because one, when it first was rolled out, it was mandated and no one likes to hear that a vaccine is mandated. So right. there was a lot of argument. The other argument with the HPV is that, well, your body clears a lot of HPV on its own. That is true, but it certainly doesn't clear all of it. And between the ages of 18 and 26, where your natural physiology, you have a lot of cell turnover, you're more at risk. And that's why it's important that young women and, and males are vaccinated in that early period, because at that time where they're likely to be exposed, their physiology says there's a lot of cell turnover. If that virus then is present, your risk of getting cancer is much, much greater. We don't offer it after 26 because at that point, your risk is much lower. So we cannot overlook the benefit of it. But I get within our community, not in, and not that that really I can say widely, um, not just in our African American right, community, right. but across the board, um, lots of concern. But the data still supports that the HPV is a safe vaccine. And with any vaccine, can you say there could be an adverse reaction? Absolutely. But the, the vast majority of people do not have that adverse reaction. Well, I used, I've, in my past job, I had to review um, histories of mothers. And mm -hmm. so, and it was crazy how they would put one thing, but then when we talked to them, and no one was in the room, they told us something different. And literally, I had to wear a pager for that job. And I can tell you, I got paged at least four or five times a week with somebody else telling me that they had herpes, but they didn't put it on there. So I tell people herpes and HPV are those two STDs, STIs, that are the gifts that keep on giving. You will have them from right. the time they tell you you have it until you leave this earth. So why, you know, if there's a way to prevent getting it. Now, there was right. someone that asked, um, does your child need it if they're not sexually active? But as you said, they need to have it. It's best to have it in that age range before 20, before 18, right? Before 18, because yeah. the, so the reality is no one, none of us can predict when our children will become sexually active. So, Trying to guess that, whether that's at 18, 21, 25, you, you really can't predict that. So um, your highest risk of having cancerous changes are in that window. Uh, many young women are getting married during that time and going on to have children. So yes, that risk is much greater at that time. And the only way to really prevent it is to ensure that the child is vaccinated. Now, you know, now it's a three dose. If you get it after 15, it's two doses before 15. And that may be changing as well. So that's probably the biggest thing is that hopefully they can get it down to a one shot um, uh, immunization. Um, but currently, if you get it before you turn 15, it's only two shots, not three. 
Uh, so I think that a lot of people, um, they're asking, do vaccines change over time? Of course they do. Right. They get better. The scheduling changes. Yeah, the scheduling changes. Right. Yeah. So, so it, it, and I think over time, you know, they just like we said, the flu vac was egg white based mm -hmm. back in the day, and now it's not. So mm -hmm. it has, you know, it's evolved. So they do right. do research and they do evolve these things. So we're not getting the polio vac. Like you're not giving any of your patients the polio vac from 1960 or whatever, 50. This is. Well, yeah. so, so just like a few of them had the thimerosal and then as of 2001, all the thimerosal was removed. Now, as far as the flu vaccine, um, you do have a preservative free, which we give to um, smaller children. And then we have the older children. Um, there is a preservative free, but then there's a one with preservative. Right. So the question would be, can I have the one? Um, right. And just uh, like when they had the, um, when their aerosol flu one too, and they were saying that right, it was right. only for certain age groups. Right, right. Yeah. And so. you know, the limitation on that too is that because it can aerosolize, um, if you have people with compromised uh, immunity, you really can't offer that one to them either. So, but, yeah. and, it, and for a couple of years, it wasn't even on the market, but it did come back last year for, um, and like, um, again, uh, I don't want people to believe that the flu vaccine doesn't have egg in it at all. There is still right. some, but again, research has shown that it, you know, you should react to it because of the type and the amount of egg that is present in it. So, so and, um, I, I want to just make one clarification because I can only imagine the comments down there, which I can't see. Um, but, you know, when, uh, I don't want to necessarily put HPV and uh, herpes completely in alignment right? Um, because, you know, HPV, those symptoms that you have, though they can be genital warts, um, yes, that can persist. Um, it, the ulcerations and stuff and the um, ability to be as infectious, um, you know, may not, again, be the same. Be the so, same. Yeah. Um, you know, just make that small clarification. Right. Before I, you get I'm just saying that's the box you have to check, you know. You, you have to check that box, you know. You, you right. have it. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, um, again, m when we look at STDs that are viruses, yes, those are usually given to you and you keep those forever. Um, the bacteria are the one that we can treat with antibiotics. Um, so making that distinction as well is that, yeah, viruses, once you get them, um, you are really signing up for most of them for life. <laughs> so. And HPV stands for human papillomavirus for anyone that didn't know. That's yes. what we're talking about, human papillomavirus, which they found to cause a type of, uh, what was the cancer that it, cervical cancer. Cervical cancer, but it can, it's responsible for um, penile cancer, oral cancers. In fact, it was the leading cause of oral cancers and throat cancers. I think it was Michael Douglas that came out and uh, oh, yeah. you know, was right. speaking about it, um, which brought a lot of attention to it. So it's important to understand that, um, you know, we talk about it as, you know, cervical and female, but males are at risk for rectal, oral, penile, any sexual organ is at risk for it. As well, genital warts is still the human papillomavirus. So it's important that um, people recognize that it is not only cervical cancer right. that uh, issue with it. Um, so someone said, if the vaccines change over time, how do we know the new formula isn't more potent or poisonous for our children? If the formula worked before, then why change it? Um, we are usually, if it's changed, it's usually because things are removed. Um, right. So like thimerosal was removed from it. So as it's studied, um, or like for um, a time, the rotavirus um, was noted to have a side effect of giving you the illness, uh, Gillian barre which is a um, neurological disorder. Um, it was pulled from the market and uh, reformulated and then put out again once they felt that whatever was causing that Guillain-Barre um, was removed. So it will only move towards safety. You know, they're not gonna take yet some unknown thing and put it in. What they're gonna do is continually remove things in order to, to make it more safe. But that's why we have the FDA. These are trials and, you know, as we're in this rush to get a COVID vaccine, the reality is, is that they have to take these safety measures to ensure that it's safe. Right. Yes, we had a vaccine yesterday on it, but there are certain trials. We have to look at it a number of different ways. We have to put it in a number of different things. 
to ensure what we are providing will not cause greater harm. Right. And thank you to those that have volunteered to take the vaccine, because, you know, this is early stages. You don't know. We don't know what we don't know. So you know, God bless those people that have signed up for that, because that that is I mean, that is very kind of them to you know offer themselves up for science like that. Someone said and we need to definitely address this. Someone said something about um, nutrition will keep you healthy. Nutrition is very important. But Absolutely. I think that we see with COVID-19, all the nutrition in the world, because Dr. Pierce is a very healthy individual, all the nutrition <laughs> in the world is not going to save you. And here's one thing I, I really encourage people who are um, considering not vaccinating their children. Um, when we look at what preservatives are in our food and how unhealthy our food is, if there's anything okay. that I will eliminate, it's processed food, the McDonald runs and all of those way before I eliminate vaccines. And I always tell my patients, look, if I ever catch you, you know, <laughs> drive through to McDonald's after you told me you don't want vaccines, I promise you I'm getting out of my car. Because it is so important to realize that the illnesses in this country, the illnesses that are affecting our community, those aren't coming from vaccines. Those are coming from the everyday food that we are putting in our mouths. And again, no one wants to stop our trip to Harold's Chicken and McDonald's and all the fast food. But as we look at our food, if you go anywhere else in the world, people just look healthier. Yeah. You know, the things that are allowed. I lived overseas, I lived overseas for three years. Mm -hmm. And all they ever said was they thought Americans were all fat. Like, I was like... Pardon me? I mean, yeah. I was half offended. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? But it must be shocking to them to come here because, I mean, really, you know, when I've gone to Australia and, you know, Scotland, when you just look at the people who have, like, when we went to Scotland, they are some meat and potato eating people. <laughs> but the obesity is just nowhere close to what we're seeing here. Yeah. When I went to Australia, the thing that was striking is when you walked along the beach, everybody was in shape. <laughs> you know, like from old to young, everybody looked healthy. When you ordered food, it was natural. Everything was natural, you know. And so we really have to look and take a stand against the food that is provided in this country. And mm -hmm. again, if you're worried about your child's health, the first thing you should be doing is ensuring that we have, you know, really removed all this processed food and names that we can't even pronounce on the back you know, and understanding what these unnatural foods are so that, you know, we don't put our children at risk. I mean, imagine obesity starting in childhood. Yeah. Really devastating. The diseases we weren't seeing until our 60s and 70s, this generation of kids are going to start seeing all of the hypertension, heart disease, all of that stuff in their early 30s and 40s. So we really, 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 before we start attacking and um, being concerned about the preservatives and vaccines, I urge you to look at the amount of preservatives and the food you eat every day. Well, on that note, I think that is a great way to end. Thank you so much, Dr. Pierce. This has been great information. And I hope everyone has um, taken notes and they will research and research and, you know, find, ask, talk to your doctor. Your doctor should be able to explain things to you. And if they can't explain it to you, then they should be able to send you someplace. <laughs> or Dr. They should be able to send you someplace to um, get the information so that you can make sure that you make a very, very knowledgeable decision for you and your family. But thank you so much. And we will see you again uh, tomorrow. Wonderful. Bye. Good night. Bye-bye.